Hi guys, welcome back. This is Mad Chat episode 370 featuring part two of my interview with Mr. David Wesley. In this part of the interview, we talk about the early days, and I mean the early, early days of the computer games industry, uh, if you can even call it that. We're talking about a time when you, if you wanted a computer, yeah, you had to build one yourself with a kit called the Altair. A lot of fascinating stuff there. We also get in a little bit to the Commodore Pet and Trash 80 days. Uh, Dave's work with uh, Avalon Hill and Discovery. A lot of really fascinating stuff, including some insights about what gamers bring uh, to the game. They actually sometimes imagine uh, the stuff's in there that's really not even in there. And uh, you can actually be inspired by that to later put it in. It's kind of complicated, but it all will make sense. Anyway, got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Wesley. So you're okay. doing all this work with... Uh... Oh, role-playing games, tabletop, miniatures mm -hmm. games, and, and for some reason decided it would be a good time to go into uh, computers. Uh, the, the video, yeah, computers and, and oh. the video game is. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, what made you want to make that transition and also why uh, the Coleco of all. Okay, systems. well, for starters, I had met, through our wargaming group, I'd met Dan Nicholson, who was four years, five years older than I was, and who was a a mathematics major at the U in graduate school at the time, which actually he was a computer major, but they didn't have a computer department. Mm, so you sure. went to math department or something else where you got to use the computer. So he got a degree in mathematics, and then after he graduated from the U of M, he went off and went to work for IBM. And he is doing some really cutting edge work at IBM's facilities in Rochester. And we stayed in touch. It's only 90 miles from here down to Rochester, right? So we were still gaming. And he told me one day, you know, someday, David, people will all have computers in their houses. And I said, yeah, right, and anti-gravity boots, too. <laughs> and he said, really, now, you know who I work for? I said, all right, well, listen, Dan, I'll believe. Because you just showed me an IBM Model 5100, $15,000 sort of portable computer that's about as easy to pick up as a small filing cabinet and has a screen this big on the front, <laughs> um, green and green and black screen, right? And you could play a couple of things like Lunar Lander on it. Um, and I said, so fifteen thousand dollars. All right, I'll believe that someday some people will have computers in their homes the way some people have grand pianos, because it takes you just about as long to learn how to program your computer as it does to learn how to play the piano, and because there will be some people who are engineers or scientists who really could use that computer there that they can run over to in the middle of the night and get their latest work onto it and not have to go into the school or the business to get at the computer. And there will be some people who want the nice shiny new IBM Model 7000 or whatever it is sitting in their living room to impress all the neighbors who come in and see it just like now they can come in and see the Steinway sitting there. Uh, they don't know how to use it, but it looks cool. And he shook his head. He was such a fool. I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, a few years later, he came back to me and he said that he was planning on starting a computer software company to develop software for home computers because it was going to come soon. This was about 1968. And by that point, he and I had built an analog computer, which was like the height of computer technology for about 1910. Um, but it was within the realm of what two guys could put together who understood the science involved. And it was cute, and I still have it, and you can push the button and the lights blink, you know, so it's kind of there. Um, but it was didn't hold a candle to, to the uh, first generation of home computers that came out. And then, in 1976, um, I was in the Army again, and I am stationed at Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, which is not that far from Rochester, and I'm still seeing Dan. And I am angling for another, I'm a reserve officer, so I'm on a one-year tour, and when that ends, it'll be go home. But there are opportunities. And so I'd been angling to get myself assigned to a one to three-year tour at Fort Greeley, Alaska, which is a way cool place to be. Mm. There's a pun in that statement, but <laughs> um, I, uh, 
I'd been looking to do that. It wasn't set yet, right? I'd just been tracking down people to talk to. And Dan called me up and he said, David, remember when we talked about you maybe you want to get out of the Army and come help me start a company? And I said, yes. He said, well, the time is now. There's this ad in the paper. You can buy a kit. You can build your own computer called an Altair. And you built your own ham radio stuff. And I'm sure that you and I could get together and we could build our own computer and start writing software for all the other guys who will have these. How much does it cost? I said, and he said, $1,000. Hmm. Oh, all of a sudden it's not four Cadillacs. All of a sudden it's a half a Cadillac. This is getting more reasonable. And there'll be a pretty fair number of guys out there who build them and still can't write programs very well. So it sounded plausible. And he was going to quit IBM, where he was a very successful guy with a great future ahead of him. And when you quit IBM, you don't come back. They weren't friendly to that idea. Um, and he's got a house and family and kids, wife, car, you name it, all the things that are going to be placed at risk by this new career move. And I'm, on, I'm, I'm a, an Army officer, I'm an Army Reserve officer when I get out of there. I don't have a family to take care of. I don't have a house to make payments on. Everything, I'm footloose and fancy free and I've got money in the bank and why not? And chances were at that time in the mid-1970s, things are really at the doldrums for the Army. And if I come back two years from now, they'll just take me back in again. So sure. So I quit and joined Dan in starting a computer game company a computer software company, and his emphasis who will do games. And while he was at it, he recruited these other game guys that he knows, David McGarry, author of Dungeon, Dave Arneson, who is by 1976, uh, things are going on the rocks down at TSR, and he has shortly become unemployed as a part of the first purge at TSR. Mm -hmm. And so he winds up joining us, and we have the four Ds, David, 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 and Daniel, we become 4D interactive systems. And then I recruit in my good friend Ross Maker, who was my partner in Discovery Games, who had co-authored Source of the Nile with me. And so, you know, we're, all these game type guys get together with Dan Nicholson, the techie, and we launch a company to do video games, or to do computer games. Not and you started off games. making games for Avalon Hill? Yeah, we started off... Um, we started off deciding that we didn't want to try to make our own games and figure out how to market them in a period when there's very little established, already running market. There are no stores selling them and that kind of stuff. Figured go to game companies, find a game company that wants to take its nose into computer games. And we'll write computer games and they'll sell them and send us royalties. And that sounded like a good business model. Um, unfortunately, the Avalon Hill Company that was interested in doing that and wanted us to make computer versions of their board games didn't understand what the limitations of the systems at the time were, that you can't reproduce an Avalon Hill map board on a Trash 80 or a TRS 80 or a Commodore PET, um, systems that do not have any graphic capability the most you could do would be print sort of mock pictures by using suitably shaped letters put next to each other. And it just doesn't work out for printing out the complexities of even the simpler Avalon Hill games. So we had a lot of learning her for them to go up. And while they were floundering their way forward trying to figure out what they wanted, they kept feature creeping us. Every time we had something almost ready, they'd announce that they wanted to add something else to it. And we were getting paid in future royalties, not hourly, by them. So everything they did that made us work more cost us money and got us nothing until the thing went on the market. When they finally started selling, our royalty payments from Avalon Hill were unimpressive. And so after the first few games that we did for them, we did um, Acquire and... Um, Oh, what else comes to mind? Darn, I'm, I'm going blank after all these years. Acquire is the one that was fun. Mm -hmm. um, and we worked on football strategy and baseball strategy. And um, I'm now at a loss to remember what the other computer Avalon Hill titles we did were. There were like five of them, mm -hmm. right? Took, took their board games and turned them into things. And then, in the, while that's going on, and we don't see you doing so good, um, Ross Maker had suggested... Uh, a game that he called The Bomber Will Always Get Through, in which you defend your city against attacking World War II 
bombers with escorting fighters and you have interceptor fighters that you try to shoot them down with. And the graphics kind of were insanely simple. It was just this horizontal, pl this, this side view. It shows altitude at the left edge of the screen, the target city is down at the bottom left corner, and across the bottom is the range out from the city. So it's sort of like a radar scope mm -hmm. presentation. And there's a little F for you and your fighters, there's a B for the enemy bombers, then E for their escort. And each turn you get to say, fly east and climb or dive or fly level, or fly west and climb, dive, or fly level. And when you're close enough to make attacks on the bombers, you can tell it to do a firing pass at the bomber from where you are, or on the same level, or from below, and from ahead or behind. So there's six different directions you could attack them from. Um, and this is a fairly graphically simple game. And Ross and I cranked out and had some fun playing around with it. And Dan, we didn't have buddy, a, a buyer for it. So uh, our, our game company, Discovery Games, Ross and me, a partnership, uh, did a deal with, Av with, uh, T with 4D Interactive Systems, our software company, to publish that game and pay royalties from, from us to our company. So, you know, there were a different set of people running the two companies. So it is a legitimate deal. It's not just name shuffling. And then Russ and I were out selling our Source of the Nile board game at conventions, and we took along the computer, our Trash 80 computer, with us. We're the only people in the place with all these guys out there selling board games, Dungeons and Dragons and all that. We're the only guys in the place with a computer on our table. People lined up to see the wonder of the ages. <laughs> and we're charging them 25 cents a play. And um, if you do well, you get a little message that gives you a secret password to sign on with next time that will get you a choice of airplanes to fly instead of just the standard one. And um, they'd give us a quarter, and we'd type in the code so they could play a game, and then they'd play for a bit, and then they'd have another quarter ready for us. And we ended up making a fair amount of money off of this. Mm -hmm. But what was really fun was they're in a game where your German pilot and you have your Messerschmitt 109s and you are trying to stop the American B-17s from getting through to Zielhafen, Target Harbor. And, uh, and the kids are playing it and two of them are standing here. And the one says to the other, man, these B-17s are impossible. I can't seem to shoot them down for spit. The other one says, well, wait a minute, let me see what you're doing. So tappity tappity on the keyboard, a couple of turns go by and he makes his attack and you can tell if the, the, that they're not happy, right? Ah, three more of my planes shot down, right? And the kid's buddy says, well, I see what you're doing wrong. You're getting around behind him and attacking him from directly to the rear on the same altitude. That's the worst possible place to attack a B-17 from because all of its rear-facing defensive guns will overlap out there. You're going to do what they really did, come in and attack from 12 o'clock high, come in from above and in front, and machine gun bullets come down through the windshield into the pilot that way. Oh, yeah, and not as many guns point that, their defensive guns point that way. Really? Yeah, give it a try. So clickety-clickety, maneuver for a while, get around, make another firing pass, and I shot down two of their bombers, and none of my guys got hit. Oh, this is great. Right. And Ross and I are listening to this dialogue, and we are just stunned, okay? They go through it, and then the two of them stand there pointing out to all their buddies about how cool this game is because it's got all this neat stuff in it, right? And we know that when we set it up, we just counted how many guns you have on the bomber. There's 13 on a B-17, so you got 13% chance of shooting down a German fighter when it attacks you. That's all there is. The direction you attack from has nothing to do with the results. But they're seeing those results because they ought to be like that. So we came away with two important lessons. The first one was we're going to revise the game so we have field, six fields of fire and how much firepower you've got in each direction on each of the different defending bombers. A good plan will do that, right? And then it was if you build it, they will come. If they play it, they will believe that they will invent things to rationalize why it must be right. And honestly, if you've ever read a column a, a fan page for Star Wars and somebody is nitpicking about making it from the Kessel Run in six parsecs doesn't make any sense. You will find long-winded explanations of why it's really okay because what he was really saying was, right, not just the scriptwriter didn't know what he's doing but it sounded cool, right. Um, 
And so this, this happens in all fans. And it was a very reasonable thing. You can convince people that they're getting more than they're getting because they will fill in the gaps that you have unfortunately left with their imaginations. So we had a good time with that. And we did a series of those games. And little discovery games sold those for a while. But what really hurt us was that the marketplace was changing so fast that we'd invent, we'd go to a lot of trouble to make games for the TRS-80 or the Commodore PET. And then they would become yesterday's news and people would stop buying them and the demand for more games for them would dry up. And we'd have to quick rewrite games to go on to other systems. And as computers got more complicated, notably the Apple II came up with some reasonably good color graphics. Now you had to put a lot more time into programming it, particularly the Apple II, which had color graphics that were done by some very clever beneath the hood sleight of hand to make things come out. And you spent a lot of time tweaking and tuning to make colors appear that weren't really a part of the programmable capability of the machine. But just two things next to each other would happen to interfere and produce a different color and stuff like that. So it's getting harder and harder to keep up with the, with the rapid turnover on what's the big system to make stuff for. And we wind up with shelves full of games for computers that are no longer hot, and they're not going to sell any more copies of those. We also fell into another problem at 40 Interactive Systems. We are in love with technology. Hmm. So we made things that were way more sophisticated than they had to be. And some people would tell us how impressed they were that we did X, Y, or Z, that we'd managed to make this happen. But while that was nice, they'd already bought the game, and it didn't make much difference to us. But it did take us three times as long to get the thing to market because of all the tweaking and polishing we were doing at a time when the, the standard to beginning was a cassette and a baggie. You had a program somebody wrote in BASIC. He banged it off. It was full of flaws. But that's OK. You'd never had a program game you could play on your computer before. And now for only 10 bucks, you could get one sheet of paper with instructions on how to load it. And with a little blurb saying why you wanted to play Impossible Caverns or whatever. And in a cassette in a baggie. And that was it, right? Cheapo, cheapo, cheapo. And we're wasting our time designing packaging art and neat plastic folding boxes and all sorts of high techy stuff for the games that cut into our profit margin when it was way in excess of what we needed to put onto the game. So businessmen, we were not. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys and gals enjoyed that. I should be back next week. I kind of missed last week. Sorry about that. Uh, it's been a pretty hectic time here at Old St. Cloud State University, but uh, hopefully things will even out here and I'll be able to uh, keep these shows coming on a weekly basis like they're supposed to. Anyway, uh, thank you very, 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 very much for your part in making these shows happen. Could not even think about doing this show without your support. Thank you very much for that. And uh, remember, if you want to help the show, uh, you want to do your part, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Only a one dollar or buck an episode is all I ask. Uh, if you don't want to do the Patreon thing, you can go to mattchat.us and there's some other options there, uh, including a GOG affiliate link uh, so you can buy some games and support the show uh, that way. So lots of ways to support the show, even just telling other people about it. Uh, whatever it is that you do to help me, I really appreciate it and want to thank you for that. So <laughs> thank you. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, leave it to old Stig. He's uh, come through for me yeah, uh, once again with some really cool news. Uh, this first one is about 90s uh, Disney afternoon uh, cartoons. Uh, Capcom is bringing out a, a, a sort of collection of their video games based on these cartoons. We're talking about DuckTales 1 and 2, uh, Darkwing Duck, uh, Chippendale's Rescue, Rangers 1 and 2, and Tailspin. Uh, all these games available for PS4, Xbox One, and the PC uh, for $19.99 is what they're uh, asking for that collection. So uh, stay tuned for that. I know you, uh, some of you probably will really, really enjoy these. Uh, I remember playing uh, DuckTales. I don't know if I've ever played these, these other games. Uh, so uh, if, if you have, uh, let me know. 
uh, what you think. I had a lot of fun with the first DuckTales game anyway. Uh, he also, uh, Stig also wrote in about a game called Kingdoms and Castles. Now this is a, a game about growing a kingdom from a hamlet to a sprawling city and then into a castle. So you design the city, you fortify it, you defend it from Vikings, and all of this in a quote-unquote beautiful dynamic world with a stylized procedural cloud system and seasons that cycle from summer to winter with a tree growth algorithm. So uh, that all sounds great. And this is uh, from a studio, by the way, based out of uh, Grants Pass, Oregon, a company called Lion Shield. I think they've done a Journey. I think I recognize that game from there. Uh, from their list, but I think it's just mainly two guys doing this, so it uh, really looks impressive. $9.99 on GOG uh, for pre-order. Uh, go check it out, Kingdoms and Castles. And then uh, finally, after uh, two years in early access, the game Battle Brothers looks like it'll be ready for a full release on March 24th, 2017. This is a, you've probably seen this game uh, already, but it's a turn-based tactical RPG, uh, one of my favorite phrases in the whole world. Uh, in which you manage a medieval mercenary company. And the emphasis here is going to be on uh, historical equipment that actually makes a real difference in the combats, uh, your strategies and whatnot. There's injuries, there's permadeath, uh, and a, a, a dynamic event system uh, that keeps things interesting uh, outside of combat. So that all sounds really good. Uh, so really looking forward to this one on March 24th, 2017. So go check that out. All right, whew. I think that'll do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? All right, so obviously with this being St. Patty's Day weekend, I thought it'd be cool to have an Irish ale. And uh, my first thought was just a, you know, a classic Guinness. I actually really like just a regular old Guinness uh, every now and then. But I found this one. This is the Antwerpen Stout. And there's a bit of a story behind this one. Apparently uh, they have, uh, until now, uh, only made this available as an export into Belgium. Uh, I don't know what was really going on there, why this wasn't more widely available, uh, but apparently for the first time uh, ever, they're making it available to the uh, United States and I guess some other countries. Uh, it is a bit more uh, strong. It's a bit stronger than a regular Guinness. I'm actually not really sure what a, a regular Guinness stout uh, has as far as alcohol. I think it may be six, maybe six or seven percent perhaps. Uh, this one's got eight percent, uh, so definitely a little bit uh, on the stronger side, which is a uh, Something I kind of like, actually, in a, in a darker beer, especially a stout. Uh, anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so here I am with this Guinness Antwerpen Stout. You know, I was, I was thinking that, really, uh, Guinness, I guess, holds a special place in my heart. It was uh, up until the time I tried a Guinness. It was, it was really the first time I tried an ale that I actually enjoyed the taste of it. You know, up until that point, I'd only had Budweiser's and Miller's and you know, Coors, all that sort of stuff, and I never really liked any of those. I just kind of thought, maybe I just don't really like beer. Uh, you know, I just hated the, the taste of those. Uh, but the first time I tried a Guinness, it was just so different, right? And that sort of sparked my little journey of uh, into all the different varieties of ales and all the uh, really good uh, lagers out there, too, uh, that a lot of people just haven't ever tried, right? If so uh, my challenge to you, if you've never gone beyond the uh, sort of Budweiser family. Uh, try to try one of these uh, more unusual brews at some point. Uh, try a micro brew, some craft brew, or maybe something like this uh, Antwerp, because I think you'll be surprised at the variety of flavors that are out there. Anyway, with all that said, uh, let's give this a let's give this a sniff, I guess first. Ah, it smells really, really sweet. Kind of get a almost kind of a wine aroma on this. Now, I want to say too, when I was pouring it. Uh, I could actually hear the fizz in this, uh, so it's got a lot of uh, character to it, I guess you could say. A nice uh, head on this. You can still sort of hear that uh, bubbling and frothing away there. Uh, always a good sign, very vibrant, uh, right? Uh, anyway, let's give it a taste. Mmm. Wow, that is a really great flavor. That's sort of, uh, sort of, I'd say a little bit on the high end, kind of a cherry, chocolatey flavor. A little bit of a bourbon uh, flavor in there as well. Uh, sort of chocolatey, coffee, uh, cherry flavors is uh, what I'm getting from this. Uh, very, very smooth. Uh, again, at 8% alcohol, you'd think there would be some, a lot of uh, alcohol uh, flavor or, or, or uh, uh, odor coming off of this, but really nothing like that at all. Uh, just very smooth and actually uh, really refreshing, I, I gotta say. You can definitely tell it's not a regular Guinness, too. This is, uh, I would say that the taste is a lot lighter to me uh, 
in terms of, uh, you know, so the sort of Guinness always reminds me kind of a chocolate milk uh, like consistency. Uh, this seems more like a, almost like a bourbon, one of those bourbon, ar uh, bourbon barrel aged uh, uh, beers that are out there is kind of what it reminds me of. Now, let me give it a, another taste here. It's just a, it's a really good flavor on this. It'd be one you'd probably want to sip on for a while. Um, it's definitely got some kick to it. I can sort of feel that a little bit of a heat there on the back end there. I guess that's the alcohol kicking in. Uh, really though, really nice flavor on this. I think if you uh, if you like Guinness and you want to try something within that sort of school, this might be a good choice. You know, let me try it one more time because I'm kind of getting some different reactions here. I guess you could call this one uh, sophisticated, right? Because there's a lot of different stuff going on. Even that third taste didn't really taste like the uh, the first taste, uh, if you can believe that. It's almost kind of a of a toffee-like flavor in there now. Maybe a little bit of a uh, what do you call those things? The uh, the black cherry uh, kind of flavors. Uh, but anyway, it's really good, really complex, uh, sophisticated uh, drink. I think you could have a lot of fun with this one uh, with some friends, and you could all get together and try to decide what uh, what it is you're tasting and smelling in this. Uh, anyway, I think this is really really good. Uh, I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. If you come across this Guinness Antwerp and Stout, I think you would uh, uh, be very happy with it. So, so give it a try. I, I would definitely recommend this uh, Guinness Antwerp and Stout. All right, let's wrap it up then with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes from pilots, and there's quite a few actually. There's some very inspiring quotations um, from all, era, all eras of aviation history. Uh, but this is the one I thought uh, I would do for today. And this is from Major Robert S. Johnson of the U.S. Uh, Air Force. And it goes something like this. The man who enters combat encased in solid armor plate, but lacking the essential of self-confidence, is far more exposed and naked to death than the individual who subjects himself to battle shorn of any protection but his own skill, his own belief in himself, and in his wingman. So ponder that and see you next week. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Now I radio clearance, over. That's Clarence, over. Over. Roger. Huh?